Um, do they have glasses? What about blonde hair? Would anyone even find this person attractive? Does their life really even matter? want to open in Numbers 14, verses 1 through 4. That night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in the wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Now the title of my message is, Your Identity is Not in Egypt. But we'll get to that in a little bit later, so let's open with prayer. Lord, we thank you that you are a great God, that you have brought your people here today, that you have something to speak to them. I pray that you anoint me to speak as the oracles of God, that not my words are spoken, but yours. And that, Lord, that Everyone is able to lay aside the distractions of the week or whatever's going on and hear what you are speaking to their hearts. We thank you, Lord, for everything you have done. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Now, a couple housekeeping things before I start. If any of you have the Bible app and are a fan of taking notes and you know that I talk too fast and can't keep up a lot of the times, we have a QR code. If you go ahead and scan it, there will be an entire outline on there, so you don't have to worry, am I going to be able to keep up? So if you have the Bible app, feel free to scan it real quick, and you'll be able to download a full outline. I see the phones coming out. Yeah. I'm a big fan of utilizing technology, and plus, I'm always on my phone, and I love having outlines, and if you want, you can take notes as you're going. So, did you know that the average person spends one hour a day looking in the mirror. We spend an average of one hour of our life every single day looking in a mirror. Now, they've done this study multiple times. They've done it in different countries. They've done it with different demographics, different genders. And I think a lot of you are probably thinking, well, I'm sure women are probably taking most of the time doing their hair, doing their makeup. Well, they did one study where it showed that men spent up to 33% more time looking in the mirror. So some of you, some of you know that you're like, I don't spend that much time. You should see how much my husband spends. So, but they've done this study multiple times. One study in Moscow found that some of their participants spent as much as four hours a day looking in their mirror, whether it was doing makeup, doing their hair, checking their outfit, or working in different stores that have mirrors, and then they just get distracted by them. So we spend a lot of our time looking in the mirror, looking at our reflection. If you were to break that down, one hour a day equals about 365 hours a year. That's a little over 15 days. And over the course of an average lifespan, you're spending more than three years of your life in front of a mirror, examining your reflection. But why do we look in the mirror? What is it that we care so much about going over here and being like, you know what? Do I look good today? Is my hair all right? Is the little frizzies coming out? Some of you might be like, well, maybe my makeup's misplaced. I don't have makeup on. Not today, at least. Um, Are my ears even? Are my eyes okay? Do my teeth look good? Do I look skinny enough? Do I look fit enough? Do I look good for the people around me? Well, scientists say, and they've done this through psychology, sociology, philosophy, that when we look in the mirror, we're examining ourselves in our truest form as others see us. We're wanting to know, how does the world perceive me? How do I look in other people's eyes? Because often, we want to be part of a clan. We want to be part of a tribe. We want to fit in. We want to know that we're not that weird outcast that's on the periphery that everyone's like, oh, don't get near them. They're a little awkward. We want to make sure that we fit in. So how do you look in the mirror? We had the video at the beginning And it's very real for some people that every time they're looking in the mirror, they're playing a guess who game. Do you have glasses? Is that okay? Do other people think my glasses look weird? Is my hair okay? Is it becoming too gray? What about my face? Does it have too many wrinkles? Then it gets deeper and deeper as we keep looking. 
Does anyone think I'm attractive? Does anyone care? Does anyone think my life matters? And it's hard because we live in a society today that is struggling with identity. And I think more than ever before, we have a nation that is at a crisis with their identity because there's so many different categories to try and fit ourselves in. To give you a glimpse into our identity in society today, according to our society, there are 108 gender identities and counting, more than 47 sexual orientations, over 420 political parties in the U.S. alone, roughly 4,200 world religions practice, at least 38 hundred unique cultures with approximately 110 distinct skin tones, speaking an estimated 7,117 languages, innumerable moral values and world philosophies, and we're wondering why our culture and our world is faking, facing record-breaking depression, anxiety, and insecurity. It's a lot to pick from, and it's not made any easier by social media and just the media in general. We have Facebook, Instagram, X, formerly known as Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, Twitter, Snapchat, whatever they are, you have so many different options. And every time we go to them, and every time we listen to the media, we bring ourselves back to this mirror, and we're not satisfied. Well, I just saw my friend on Facebook went on the vacation I really wanted to go on. Well, I just saw that my friend got the promotion that I wanted. They got the dream job. They got the house that I'll never be able to afford. They got my dream car, and that's just not possible for me. And we keep comparing and comparing and seeking our identity through all these different avenues, and we're just not happy. And so we start finding ourselves lost, looking for a community. And this isn't a new epidemic. I mean, I think most recently thrown back into our focus, we saw with the Jesus Revolution movement, the reminder that at one point in our history, the hippie movement was enormous. Why? Well, it was about love and acceptance, about bringing in whomever, and also dulling and distracting yourself from the pain with intimacy with whomever you wished, with drugs or any other means of escape. It was fine, and you were loved, and you were accepted in. And today, we have those same groups, but they go under different titles. We have the LGBTQIA+, communities. We have BLM communities, and I'm not here to pass or assess any judgment on those groups or get political. I'm just saying those groups espouse that we love you, we accept you, welcome in. And so many people that come into these communities when asked, well, why did you want to be a part of it? I was lost, and they said, come as you are. And I told them that I was confused, so come as you are. And as they got more and more confused, they're like, it's okay to be confused, we'll still accept you in. And this is how the church is supposed to operate. But I think so often, even we, the church, can become confused because we're in a society that there's so many different ways to identify, even as a believer. Did you know in the U.S. alone, there's 200 Christian denominations? In the U.S. alone, around the world, there's over 45,000 of them. And so I think it makes it difficult, and it reminds me of when Paul talks about, he's having issue with a church, and they're saying, well, I'm of Paul. Well, no, I'm of Apollos. Well, I'm of Peter. He was with Jesus. And they're getting into these arguments about, well, my brand name pastor, my brand name uh, shepherd is, and it's causing division in the church. And Paul says, no, we are all of Christ. And I think it becomes difficult in our society when people come up to us and ask, well, what kind of Christian are you? Are you Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Foursquare, AOG, Northeast, Calvary Chapel, Vine? Are you maybe Orthodox, Anglican, Episcopal? Maybe you're an old-fashioned Quaker. Where do you fall? And you're like, I don't know the differences. And it's true, and so many people want to try and find this group and find their denomination so that when they look in this mirror, they're like, I know who I am, I know exactly what I believe. But oftentimes, we're just struggling to find our identity. And when we try to bring people into the Christian walk, we tell them, come to church with me. Well, there's a church by my house. Well, that's not my church. Well, what's different about that church? And we find ourselves looking at it like it's cans of soda. Well, that one's just really weird when you like taste that one. It's just very exotic. Well, what about this other church? I think that one's a little more boring in flavor. You should really come and try my soda. And it's, we're trying to identify what is different, what makes me me, what makes my church me. And I'm so honored to be with the pastors that we are because our pastors, if you guys don't know, spend a lot of time with other pastors of other churches, spend a lot of time meeting and fellowshipping with other pastors and taking them in and loving because they recognize 
that we are one in Christ, that we don't have to be separated, that we can come under one roof and love God together. I think oftentimes one of the reasons we struggle is because our identity begins to develop during adolescence. And it's a difficult time, and I'm sure many of you remember that adolescence maybe wasn't the most comfortable time. You didn't feel perfect in your skin. And oftentimes, we're shaped by stealth through our culture, through our experience, through our communities, and we don't even realize it's happening, but we experience this thing called adolescence angst. And you guys might remember when you're going in front of the mirror and you're more like this than anything, and you're like, oh, well, I, oh, my skin's like breaking out constantly, and I don't know if Timmy's going to think I look cute in this outfit. Um, am I going to fit in? Am I going to make the sports team? Am I going to become the musician, I hope? And you have all these dreams and ambitions, and it gets very difficult. And even clinical psychologists have identified what happens when you don't know your identity. The common symptoms include insecurity, anxiety, depression, loss of value for yourself, feeling lost or aimless with no sense of purpose, and difficulty regulating emotion. I'm sure all of you remembered back now to when you were a teenager or a young adult, and you're like, yep, I don't want to go back there. And, it's, and the frustrating thing for many of us is, and you might be feeling it right now, is I still am experiencing those feelings today. Because sometimes we don't find our identity in that time. Normally it's a time of finding ourselves, and sometimes we just don't know where we land. Am I going to accomplish that dream? I had a dream to become an amazing musician and it's just not panning out. Well, I wanted to go and become a celebrity and my dream is far from me. I just wanted to become wealthy so I could take care of my family and right now I'm working minimum wage. I just don't see it possible. And we start to struggle with how do we get to where we thought we would be? How do we become the identity we wanted and what does our identity consist of? Our identity is primarily influenced by two factors. One, the externalities, that which is external from us, our location, where we live, what's going on, our physicality, and then our interiority, which might be a weird word for you. It just means that which is internal, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions. Those are the things that we are dealing with when it comes to our identity. But we're not the first people to deal and suffer with identity crisis. I opened up with a passage out of Numbers with the children of Israel, so let's go back and find out what's going on with them. To give a little backdrop to this story in the background, first off, if you don't know who the children of Israel is, that's fine. If you're curious, Pastor Fred mentioned a guy named Abraham in the Bible earlier. Abraham met with God. God said, I will be your God, and you will be my people, and I will make you as numerous as the stars in the sky, the sand on the shore, if you honor me and follow me and serve me. And Abraham said, deal. And so Abraham had a son named Isaac, and God came to Isaac and said, I will be your God, you will be my people, and I will make your nation numerous if you follow me and honor me and make me your God. And he said, deal. And as Pastor Fred just mentioned earlier with Jacob, Jacob asked the same thing. If you are my God and provide for me, I will be your people, and I will honor you all the days of my life. And one day, Jacob even got in a wrestling match with God because he thought that was practical, to wrestle with the God of the universe. And... Some of you are a little uh, um, stubborn, and you're like, yeah, I would have done the same thing. I'm like, I'm not tangling with an all-powerful being. I'm just going to be like, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. Um, but he wrestled with him, and God said, you know what? I will bless you. And he changed his name from Jacob to Israel, and Israel means those who wrestle with God. And so when you hear the children of Israel, it's the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, a.k.a. Israel. So we find the children of Israel have been in Egypt for a while. And now, in Egypt, they didn't have a great time. They were under oppression, under slavery. And to give a backdrop of Egypt at that time, think of the largest cultural hubs over history. We had Rome, Greece, China, England, Japan, America. We've had different times in history where they have been the mecca of trade, of culture, of religion, of art, and trade, and at this time, Egypt was that. They are the OGs. When you think of all these major societies, Egypt was the premier. I mean, we still today, when we look at the pyramids, we're like, how did they do that? I don't really... Maybe there were aliens that came down. Because we still can't figure out, because they were smart. They were innovators. They were the top of the top at that time. And so this is where the Israelites are, in a mecca of culture and trade, 
However, they're not having the great time because the Egyptians, they have the Mediterranean Sea, the Red Sea, so they can travel to the known world and trade goods. They can go down the Nile and have a fresh source of water and get down most of Africa. They have the best crops, the best livestock. Their life is brimming, but because of also all that trade and intermingling, you have a lot of different religions coming into the area. You have a polytheistic religion in Egypt where they have a god for the sun, they have a god for the Nile, they have Pharaoh as their god. He is born of a god and he rules over us. And so they have very different beliefs. And because of the intermingling of cultures, you also have different beliefs that don't fly with Israel. Israel is a monogamous nation. They believe in marrying one person of the opposite gender and having a family and taking care of them and honoring God in different ways, being honest. And Egypt is a little more loose with their values. They don't mind getting a little crazy and if they have more than one partner and whatever gender and whatever age, and they don't care. And so children of Israel are struggling with this because they're enslaved to the Egyptians. You know, when you're in slavery, you don't have a lot of options. You're forced to capitulate your beliefs. If you are a slave to someone and they say, you're going to come in and be intimate with me, doesn't matter your gender, doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter if you're married, you're forced to it. And a lot of children of Israel were being forced to do things that were capitulating their beliefs. But they were a people that still sought to honor God, and so God continued to cause them to increase and be blessed. And the Pharaoh was getting nervous because of this. When you see a people that you're ruling over continue to increase, it gets a little dicey. One of the things that's interesting about Egypt at this time, they were about three to four million people. Well, the children of Israel, when they have an exodus, they count about 600,000 men, not including women and children. That's around two million children of Israel in Egypt. I don't know if you think about the math on that, but if you're four million strong and you have a nation of two million that is constantly and rapidly expanding, it's difficult to keep them in line. And so Pharaoh becomes a little nervous. So he decides that he's going to give them an unbearable workload. So he starts having them not work their normal day, but extending that and giving them less supplies. They don't have enough straw to make the bricks, and they're trying to build these huge cities, these huge monuments, these temples that they don't agree with. And the Pharaoh's making it harder and harder, and he says, this will break their spirits, this will stop them. But you can't stop God's people. And so they continue to expand and grow stronger. And so Pharaoh says, I will do something about it. And he decides to bring the Hebrew midwives and says, every male that is born to them, you will slaughter. And so he puts into a policy of infanticide. And at this point, it's when the children of Israel are fed up and they're coming to their end. And so we find ourselves in Exodus 2, verses 23 through 25. It says, years passed and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan under their burden of slavery. They cried out for help and their cry rose up to God. Your cries rise up to God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant promise to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. We are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he remembers his promises. He looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. You see, God knew that his people were losing their identity, that they were in a place that they were being forced to capitulate, they were being overworked, and they weren't having what he had promised. He had promised them a land. He had promised to make them a great nation. And he realized that he had to move them out of Egypt. Because the reality is, we can never deal with what's going on internally until we deal with the external. Because if any of you have ever been in a broken household, it's hard to start repairing what's inside when you're still in that environment. When you're trying to get out and make your own identity and have a healthy identity, it's difficult when everyone around you is looking down on you and talking crap and telling you that you're never going to be that, you're never going to move past it. So God puts into place a way to deal with it. Many of us carry what I would call such a heavy emotional debt. I think a lot of people would just call it baggage and clinically you would call it trauma, but I like to think of it as emotional debt. One reason why is I'm in finances and finances make sense. I'm a ones and zeros person. But when I think of financial debt, I have a friend, an individual whose family grew up in debt their whole life. And so they got into real life, got a job, and they got a credit card, and they started swiping, and they started swiping, and they felt bad, and they'd buy themselves an outfit. I feel a little bit better. Then they started swiping. I'm a little hungry. I'm going to start swiping. And they were in a massive amount of debt. 
And I was telling them, hey, you know, you'll feel so much better if you get out of that debt. And they're like, no, it's accounted for my budget. I'm fine. I'm so used to it. It doesn't even bother me at all. I'm like, no, 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 you don't understand. You will feel better. And they're like, no, no, I feel great. And so I kept persisting and persisting and was obnoxious and annoying and kept <laughs> pestering until finally, because if you ever talk to me about finances, I will let you know, debt is terrible. You will feel so much better. And I will always preach that to you. So I kept pestering this individual. And finally, they started paying off their credit card. And they got out of one credit card, two credit card, three credit card. And I was talking to them. And they're like, Cameron, you don't understand. I feel so much better. I'm like, yeah, I know. And they're like, no, 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 no. See, I had this weight on my shoulders that I didn't even realize was there because I have lived under it my entire life. So many of us carry this emotional debt that we've lived under our entire life that we don't recognize. So God sees his children experiencing this. He sees the children of Israel going through this. So God sets out to deal with this identity crisis with a person who struggled with his own identity. Enter Moses! For those of you who don't know the story of Moses, I'm going to do it real quick for you guys. Moses was born into a Hebrew household, and very quickly his parents were like, oh no, he's going to get murdered. So they shipped him down the river. Not really, they put him in a basket, very taken care of. But, you know, they just shipped him down, and who but the Pharaoh's daughter would find Moses, draws him up out of the water, gives him the name Moses, that's what it means to be drawn up out of the water, and she says, ah, I have a child. How do I take care of it? And so Moses' sister is nearby, says, I know a woman that can help you, goes and gets her mom. Moses is raised in an Egyptian household by his mother, a Hebrew woman, and has a very complicated upbringing. He despises and refuses to be called the daughter, the son of the daughter of the Pharaoh. He refuses that name entirely. And he wants to see his people set free. He wants to deliver. He wants to help. Meanwhile, the people are looking at him and looking at him and they're like, um, I'm covered in crap and hay and mud and you're in the palace looking clean and dressed and nice. And he's like, no, 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 that's, that's not my identity. I'm a children of Israel. And they're like, have you seen yourself? And no, 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 I am. And they're like, you're pretty clean for that. And one day, Moses sees his people being oppressed. There's an Egyptian slaver who is beating a Hebrew gentleman. And so Moses steps in and he's eager to do the right thing. He wants to deliver the people. He wants to be the man that helps. And sometimes we get out way in front of where we're supposed to be. And that's what Moses does. And he ends up murdering this individual. Panics, decides to bury the body in the sand and tries to go about his life thinking that that's not going to come back up. But the next day, he sees two Hebrew men fighting. He goes over, no, 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 no. We are all the children of Israel. Should we not be brothers? Should we not live in harmony? And they say, who are you? Are you going to slaughter us like you did that Egyptian man? And Moses realizes he's caught. That's it for him. And so he books it. You don't want to be the person going before Pharaoh, who is your grandfather, and saying, hey, I chose my people over your people and slaughtered one of your overseers. And so he books it. And he goes to the backside of the wilderness for 40 years. How many of you feel like you've been on the backside of the wilderness for 40 years? How many of you feel like you've been there, put out to pasture, and God's forgotten about you? You're like, God, I had an identity. And it's a far way away. It's on the other side. I thought I was called for something great. You gave me an idea, a vision of what I was supposed to do. I'm out here. And I want to be way over here. But you've set me out. And many of us can identify with that. And Moses though, his desert wasn't to be forgotten. It was a training ground. It was a place where he learned so many important things. He spent 40 years being a shepherd. For those of you who have never read, uh, Pastor Fred and Cindy actually gave me this book. Um, it's called The Way of the Shepherd. It's an amazing book on leadership. And it talks about how if you follow the way of a shepherd you can be an amazing leader. And so God was shaping him in those 40 years to become the leader, not that he thought he was supposed to be, but what the children of Israel needed, who God needed him to be. So one day, while he's forgotten his identity, he's given up on his identity, God comes to him. And he comes to him in a fiery bush. And Moses' response is, what the heck, that doesn't happen. I'm going to go investigate. Seriously, that's his response is, that's abnormal. I want to check it out because, you know, guys, there's fire and it's not normal and so we want to go play with it. And so he gets closer to this bush and he realizes as God calls out to him and he says, Moses. And he's, Moses is like, okay, they definitely don't talk. Something's up here. 
And God tells him that he has a plan for him. <laughs> and you have to realize, this is Moses. He's been hiding for 40 years. Nobody has a plan for him. And he says, well, who are you to tell me that you need me? He says, I am God. I am Yahweh. I am that I am. Interesting to be, the name Yahweh means to be. I am I will be and will be forever. I have always been. I am now and will be forever. He says, I am that I am. And you're going to tell my people, Yahweh, your God, has sent me. Ah, that was answered pretty quickly. So what's your plan then? Um, So God tells him, you're going to go and deliver my people. How? How am I going to do that? (laughs) Ha ha. And he's like, I'm going to give you miracles to show and you're going to deliver my people. These miracles are going to remind them of the God they serve. They're going to remind them of the identity they have. He's like, how are you going to do that? And so he gives them different miracles. Throw your rod down, it'll turn into a serpent. Put your hand into your cloak, pull it out, it'll be diseased, put it back in, and it'll be healed. What if those don't work? You're going to pick some water up from the Nile, throw it on the ground, and it'll turn into blood. Man, you got an answer for everything. Um... You know what? I know, I know. We've been talking now, God, for about five minutes, and you can tell I suck at speaking. I've always gotten tongue-tied, tripped over my words. I can't speak. And God gives one of my favorite responses out of the Bible. There's two times where God kind of answers people this way, and I love it. God, it says in the Bible that God began to get angry with Moses, and he says, who is it that makes man's mouth? Is it not I? And he tells him, I will make you able to speak. And Moses is like, no. And So God says, fine, I'll send your brother Aaron with you. He's on his way, he's going to go with you. And so everything that Moses is trying to do to run away from his identity, because he's forgotten it on the backside of the desert for 40 years, God's like, I will show you, I will provide, I will do it. And so Moses capitulates and he decides to go back to Egypt and he starts confronting the Pharaoh. He starts going through this. And it's amazing because every miracle and plague that God performed destroyed the Egyptians' identity. You want to know what why those plagues were so important? Let's look at the first one, turning the Nile into blood. Well, they believed that the Nile was a god, and so God murdered them. Yeah. Yahweh slayed the Nile and turned it into blood. And you see that with every single one. You see Ra is one of the most notable gods of all time in Egypt, little g god. And so God darkens Ra, and people are terrified. The Pharaoh was seen as a god, and so the last of the plagues killed someone from Pharaoh's household that he is man, he is not God, he is not over Yahweh. And so, God throughout this time, restoring Moses' identity, restoring the children of Israel's identity, and showing them that they are not Egyptians, that their God is stronger. So, Moses gets his point across after a number of plagues. Pharaoh is a little uh, hesitant and finally agrees, and Moses starts bringing the people of Israel into the wilderness. I think a lot of times that's what it feels like when we're coming into identity. It feels like we come here and we're struggling because we're in the wilderness. We're in the struggle. We're in the difficulty. And we're like, God, I thought that once you established my identity, it would just be immediate and there would be nothing that I'd have to deal with. But how many of you know that we come from difficulty? We can't just get over it in a second. God wants us to grow, to become better, and bring hope to other people. So sometimes it feels like we have to go through a wilderness to get to the promised land. But then the question becomes, what is our identity? To me, it's fascinating that the very first thing that God says about humans is in establishing their identity. Let's jump to Genesis 1, 26 through 27. It says, And God said, Let us make humankind in our image and after our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the cattle and over the earth and over all creatures that move on the earth. God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. So Cameron, I missed the point. What is our identity? Okay, that's fair. Is our identity something external? Is it maybe the way we look, the way our body looks? Well, I would say no, because we read in the Bible that God says that he does not have a body. Yes, Jesus took on the flesh of man, but his body is different than ours. He is a spiritual body, so obviously it's not just the way we look. And then plus, some monkeys kind of look like some of us. I would say me in particular. Um, 
I went to the zoo recently and I was questioning, no. Um, but we all look very different. Well, maybe it's something internal. Is it intelligence, reason, thought, creativity? I would say no. And the reason why is because we see animals exhibit intelligence. We see monkeys learn sign language. We see them uh, creativity. Elephants paint pictures of themselves. We see the ration and reason in animals when mice go through mazes and solve them. And plus, what happens if someone becomes brain dead? Are they no longer created in the image of God? What about the unborn life? Are they not in the image of God? Of course they are. Psalms 139 talks about, you knit me together in my mother's womb. Or my personal favorite is Jeremiah 1.5, where he tells Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. God has a plan and purpose for our life before we even step foot. He knows our identity and he knows everything about us. See, our identity that God bestowed cannot be revoked. No matter what anyone's told you, no matter what you've believed, the image of God on you is irrevocable. <clears throat> it is what humans are. We are imagers reflecting God. That is what our identity is. And some of you are like, I have no idea what you mean by imagers. So let's look at verse 27 it was again in Genesis. In the original Hebrew it says, make humankind as our image, not in our image. What that means is that by nature of who we are, we are to reflect God's glory. We are to reflect who He is. We are to be the mirror that reflects back to God. And this was repeated through Scripture when we go to Deuteronomy 5.11. We often hear this verse quoted and we think that people mean that we're not supposed to cuss and use God's name as a curse word. That's not what this verse means at all. One quick second. Do not use God's name as a curse. There is another commandment out of the 613 that covers that, but that's not what this verse is referring to. This commandment specifically is so beautiful when you understand the original language of it. So I'm going to teach you two Hebrew words real quick. There's nasa, which means to carry or to bear, and then there's shav, which means unworthy or in a manner that is worthless of conduct. We read, You shall not take the Lord your God's name in vain, for the Lord your God will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. You shall not take, you shall not carry or bear the name of Yahweh in a way that is unworthy or conducting worthless manner. It's saying that God's name is holy and we are his imagers and we are to reflect that nature of him. We see this again in Mark 12. It's a beautiful passage. And so many of times we read this and we don't see the full context behind it. We know the context behind it normally for us, is that the Pharisees are questioning him about should we pay taxes to Caesar or should we just render unto God? And this is a trick question because if he says don't pay taxes, Rome's going to come in and arrest him. But if he says to pay taxes, all the people are going to be mad. So Jesus says to bring him a coin, and this is where we find it. So they brought him one, and he said to them, whose image is this and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. And so we know it goes on to say, so render unto Caesars what is Caesars, and render unto God what is God's. And everyone claps, yeah, mic drop, burned. They got him. But it's so much more beautiful, because when you look at the Bible in Greek, because Jesus would have had the Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. When you read Genesis 1 in Hebrew, the same Greek word that is used in Genesis 1.26 to state that humanity is made in the image of God, is in this same verse, if you can bring that back up, where it says, whose image? See, Jesus was making a power statement here. He was saying that Caesar's image is inscribed on this coin so he can lay claim. But whose image is inscribed on you? Mine, so I lay claim to you. His image is inscribed on us. He lays claim. We are imagers reflecting a glorious God. Can we uh, pull up that picture real quick? So I don't know how many of you are art connoisseurs or anything. So <clears throat> over here we have the Guggenheim, we have the Mona Lisa, we have Michael Jackson's Thriller, we have Michelangelo's David, we have an Antoni Stradivari violin, and we have the Aston Martin DB5 used by James Bond. If any of you are James Bond fans, you will recognize this car because 
Aston Martin was already an enormous brand, but it was made famous by James Bond. The Guggenheim is by Frank Lloyd Wright, one of the world's most famous architects, and Mona Lisa, Leonardo da Vinci. All of these are considered, in their category, the top pristine art. But why? We've seen better pictures than the Mona Lisa. We've seen statues that are better than Michelangelo's David. We can make music now that is more precise and accurate than a Stradivari guitar or a violin. So why are these so valuable? These pieces have value because of who left their mark on them. Their value increases because whose signature and creativity was put into them. Our value has increased because God's signature is on us. We are now priceless. God sent his son for us because to him we are worth everything. We're going to jump to Isaiah 64, 8. It says, Yet you, O Lord, are our Father. We are the clay and you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. We're not something haphazardly slapped together. We are crafted, molded. He is shaping us. We are the work of his hand. Let's jump to Ephesians 2.10. I say this verse a lot and I'll stop and explain the significance of this verse every single time because I think it's beautiful. It says we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That word workmanship is the Greek word poema from which we get poem. We're not just some thing that God fastened together and said go out and do whatever. No, we are a beautiful piece of art, a poem. We are his workmanship created for Good works, not just to exist and be bored and be miserable. We are created for good works that He planned beforehand, before you realized you had a destiny, before you realized you had an identity. God established something for you. Additionally, it is only the creator of the work of art that can reveal its identity, its purpose, its plan. And so it is only God who can reveal to us our identity. Let's jump to Matthew 16, 13 through 20. This is when Jesus is talking to his disciples and his ministry is getting bigger. And he says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, are? Some, they say, said John the Baptist, some Elijah and other Jeremiah, or maybe one of the prophets. And he said, but do, who do you Say that I am. Simon Peter answered the million dollar question. He said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And we all rejoiced. He got the question right. But what Jesus says next is interesting because Jesus answered and said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, or Simon, son of Jonah, for it is not flesh and blood that revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. See, it is only our Father in heaven who can reveal our identity. There are over a hundred scriptures in the Bible that say what our identity is. And over 35 of them talk about our identity in Christ. And so, let me explain, <clears throat> if you are curious, who you are in Christ. These are going to go quickly, so they are in your outlines. In Christ, we are a new creation. We are born again. We are alive in Christ, and Christ lives in us. Our life is hidden with Christ, and we are children of God, friends of God, the righteousness of God, members of the household of God, citizens of heaven, ambassadors for Christ, making appeals on God's behalf. We are appointed, chosen, and fruitful, bearing labors because we have been made right, justified by His grace, holy, without fault in His eyes, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession. We have redemption and forgiveness of sins. We are no longer slaves to sin because we are set free from the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation for us in Christ because we have the hope of glory and we have peace with God. All because we are part of the body of Christ. We are fellow heirs with Christ, seed of the Christ in heavenly places. We have the spirit of Him. We are one spirit with Him. We have the temple of the Holy Spirit and we have been called to a holy calling. We have been filled in Him. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. We have the same blessings of Abraham received because of his faith. We are more than conquerors. We are the light of the world. We have power, love, self-control. We have the mind of Christ. We have boldness, confidence, and access to God. He supplies to every need and He works all things together for our good. That is the God we serve. That is the identity you have because that is who He is. That is who He has made us. That is who He has made you. If you struggle with your identity, know who God has made you today. That is the God we serve. And He doesn't just say, I put you here, good luck. No, He says, I chose you. I chose you. I appointed you. Before you knew, I made you. That is the God we serve. He is amazing. We started all of this at Numbers 14 where the children of Israel are on the precipice of promise. They're right there 
identity is one step away. They're so close. And sometimes we struggle and we just don't take that step. And it's frustrating because God's like, I chose this for you. Genesis 13, I made this covenant. Just step over the line. God's telling them, I've been a cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. I have fed you. I have given you meat. This isn't the first time you want to go back to Egypt. The last time you said, we don't have meat. We had it in Egypt. And he literally said, I will give you so much meat. It comes out your nostrils. That's an awesome response by God. <laughs> They're right there. They're pulling a Michael Jackson saying, I'm looking at the man in the mirror. Maybe if you're more of a Mulan fan, it's when will my reflection show? And they're wondering, when will it be? And they don't go. And they're like, God hasn't prepared it. There's too many giants. But we find out 45 years later in Joshua 2, verses 9 through 7, they find out that it was there all along. It says, I know the Lord has given you this land. This is Rahab talking to them when they're scouting out the land. She says, I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We are all afraid of you. Everyone in this land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord, your God, is supreme. He is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. You know, I've gone through pain. I've gone through trauma. You guys have heard my testimony I've gone through abuse as a child. I was bullied growing up. It doesn't matter. I'm not saying that pain wasn't real. But recently, in the last couple of years, God kind of sat me down and he's like, let's take a look in the mirror. And I went over there and I realized I didn't like myself. I hated myself. And I remember praying to God, find the things in me that you don't like and get rid of them. It's been a couple of years and there's been a lot of hard decisions I've had to make and really humble myself, step back from things that I wanted to go for with everything inside of me. And I couldn't explain to my family, my loved ones, what was going on, but God was calling me to it and I couldn't explain and it sucked, it hurt, it was painful. But I was sitting with one of my mentors recently and I said, you know what? I like myself. I even love myself now. Some of you have never been able to look in the mirror and say that. But I'm telling you, find your identity. Get out of the externalities. Deal with the, interior, the interiority. And find your identity. It is all over Scripture. Believe it with everything. And you will see God change you. Lord, we thank you that you are working within all of us to change us, to shape us, to make us something new. We thank you that if there is something in us that you don't like, that you eliminate it. We thank you that you have made us new that we are new creations with a new identity, and we thank you that you, God, have changed and transformed us. We thank you that as we aspire to find our identity in you, that you reveal it to us daily. We thank you for your son's sacrifice and that he restored us back to you. We thank you, Lord, for all of these things that you have given to us, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to welcome Pastor Fred back up. because. <clears throat> wow. Some of you. Thank you, Cameron. All glory to God. Amen. Some of you today have struggled with your identity for a while, and it's time to come home. It's time to come to Christ. And Pastor Fred's going to lead some of you in that prayer today. If you want to find your identity in Christ, He's going to lead you through a prayer and then he's going to give a blessing and dismiss. But he is our pastor. He is the one that cares for you and guides you. I can't tell you how many times Pastor, pastor Red and Pastor Cindy have been there for me and they have loved me. So let's welcome him up as he leads us Thank in that you. prayer. Thank you so much, Cameron. Thank you for that beautiful word. Wasn't that awesome, guys? Wow, what a, what a wonderful we're to help us in our identity with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're so thankful. And as we are in the spirit of prayer just now, as we're closing, maybe some of you in the house, as Cameron said, you're struggling with your identity. Your struggles can be over through Christ Jesus, our Lord. God loves you so much. Please know that. I don't care who you are, what your background is, what, where you came from. God loves you immensely, so much so that he sent Jesus 
to bear every sin, every curse, every burden that you could possibly have. And through the power of the cross, if we call upon Jesus, the Bible says, we will be saved. Our sins will be forgiven. We'll have our identity in Christ and his love and his grace for us. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed here today, if that's you, you're in the house and you feel a tug, you feel a stirring in your heart. You don't know who you are. You don't know where, you don't know where you've been and you're just like, I need, I need a breakthrough. I need an identity solution in Christ. That's you today. You must call upon him. It won't happen automatically. You must say yes to Jesus. God gives you a choice. You can say yes or you can say no. Jesus said very powerfully one time, you're either for me or you're against me. Which one? Make a choice. It's up to you. You can make a choice this morning to say yes to him. Or maybe you're here today. You say, Pastor Fred, I'm a Christian. I've been saved, but I've just been going my own way, doing my own thing, and I've had enough of that. I want to rededicate my heart and my life to Christ, and I want God's way in my life. So if that's you, a tender moment, and you say, yes, I want to say yes to Jesus right now. I want my identity to be in him. Or I want to rededicate my heart and my life. Very powerful moment. Only you can decide. But if that's you, lift up your hand very boldly right now. Right where you are. See, you're going to say yes to Jesus today. Thank you for your hand. God bless you. Thank you. you who, come on, who else? Who else? Thank you over here to my right. God bless you. Don't let this moment pass. You just heard a powerful word about how God loves you and saying, Jesus, you must respond. Include me in that prayer, Pastor Fred. I need Jesus or I need to read that. Thank you. I see your hand. God bless you. Anyone else? Uh, I, I, I'm going to wait just another moment. The very back. Thank you so much. God bless you. Is there one more? An uplifted hand quickly right now. And I'm, I'm going to pray in just a moment. Thank you. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Let's help these that are making that decision for the Lord. Everyone, please pray, the, pray this prayer. If you lifted your hand or you should lift, please pray with me as we all pray together. Say this after me. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father thank, you Jesus, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me. I make Jesus Christ my identity in life. I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and restoring me. Thank you, Lord, for a new beginning and a fresh start. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you give a round of applause? Come on, all those that called on Jesus today, all those making their identity in Christ, never forget it. Never allow it to never be moved off of that truth, that powerful revelation. Say, we're rejoicing with you. And hey, if you called on Jesus today, you know you made a powerful decision for the Lord or rededicated your life. We're rejoicing with you. We have a place out in the foyer. Bill and Debbie are going to be out there and some others. They want to greet you. We have, if you don't have a Bible, we have a free Bible we want to give you. I know you can go online, but sometimes it's nice to have a copy of the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, please stop by the table out there. We also have other uh, material that we want to bless you with that will help you in your new walk with God. And most of all, please keep coming back to church, right? I tell people, come back to church. Come for one year and let the Word of God transform your life and the power and the love of God. Do a powerful work in your life. So please come back. Invite friends and loved ones. They need Jesus as well. Thank you, Cameron, so much for that powerful word today, for encouraging all our hearts. That was awesome. Praise the Lord. Thank God. How many of you know we need every generation, come on, to fulfill the will of God for their generation, and God's doing a beautiful thing. I'm so thankful for all the young people we have in our church and all the generations. We need all of them, and may they all come to the full of all the gifts and callings upon their lives and we're so thankful for that you ready for the blessing lift up your hands i'm going to speak this blessing over everyone here in the house and those of you watching as well as your pastor may the lord bless 
May the Lord protect and prosper your way, you and your loved ones throughout this week. According to Psalm 91, that you dwell under the shadow of the Almighty. And may God give His angels charge concerning you that no evil plague, disaster, or calamity comes near your dwelling. And may God place you at the right place at the right time with the right people. And may you walk in the fullness of the revelation of your identity in Christ both now and forevermore. And finally, may His shalom peace and rest be your constant companion throughout this week. In Jesus' name, say amen if you receive that. God bless you. We love you. You are dismissed. <laughs>